Welcome, everyone. Uh, and thank you to, um, to, to Clay and Emily for uh, a very generous introduction. Hopefully, the uh, expectations are not too high. Um, but uh, I, I want to start out with a few thank yous. So I want to thank um, the organizers of QuidCon, and in particular, Emily. And Tuesday, I want to give a particular shout out for all of their hard work and uh, for the invitation for me to deliver this keynote today. I want to thank all of you for choosing to be here on a Friday evening. I think this is a hugely important conversation. And every time I revisit this conversation, I learn something new. Um, so I'm excited about the possibilities of what we're going to learn together today. And I want to thank, in particular, the Indigenous Black, Brown women and trans people who have taught me, who've been gracious enough to teach me the people from whom I've learned everything that I know, and I would not be here speaking on this topic without them. So I want to center that as we as we get started. For those of you that don't know, my name is Yara Kodersha. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of Quidditch Canada. However, if you will allow me, um, I would like to take that hat off for the remainder of my time with you and um, speak to you as a person who has had the privilege to engage in anti-oppression and anti-racism work for about eight years now. And I also want to speak to you as a person that's participated in systems impacted by anti-oppression and anti-racism. Uh, I say that naming fully that this is a lifelong journey for me and that I am not an expert. And that felt important enough to put on the slide. So I've put that there. <laughs> I don't presume to know everything. It is, in fact, I think impossible to know everything about this topic, but I've participated in a lot of learning and dialogue on issues of oppression and on equity. And so I'm excited to learn some of those, uh, to share some of those learnings with you. Um, but as I said, I actually expect to walk away from this conversation having learned something new myself. So um, what I expect we will embark on over the next hour and in the months and years preceding is a bit of collective knowledge making, something that I think we can create together as a group. Before we proceed much further, I want to provide a very explicit trigger warning on some of the things that I'm planning on discussing today. So I am planning on talking about institutional racism, gender violence, and state violence. I'm going to be talking about my own personal experiences of racism and misogyny and homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, as well as speaking very explicitly to harm that I've caused and harm that I've participated in. And I want to reaffirm each of you and your experiences. So uh, I really encourage you to do whatever it is you need to do to look after yourselves as we reflect on this conversation. So if that means taking a step away at a certain point, if that means turning me on mute whenever you need to, I, I encourage you to do that. That said, I also want to draw attention to discomfort and make a very explicit distinction between discomfort and harm. And when we talk about racism and when we talk about oppression, sometimes it's hard to tell those two things apart. Um, particularly for those of us that are newer to this space, uh, being, be, drawing your attention to the way that you have almost certainly acted as a participant in a system of oppression is a deeply, intensely discomforting experience. Um, some of the other emotions that you might, uh, that you might experience in your time with me have been listed on the slide, uh, including but not limited to defensiveness, grief, anger, joy, sadness, frustration, affirmation. Some of the things that I might, that I might be speaking to might be really affirming for you. And if you come across an intense emotional experience as we're talking today, um, that would be a time where I would encourage you not to put me on mute and not to walk away from the screen and actually to really sit with that emotional experience. So I'm gonna invite you to pay close attention to your emotional experience over the next hour. Something I'm planning on talking about is how one of the aims of white supremacy and of oppression is to divorce us from feeling. It's, a, it's about separating the emotional embodied experience of our lives out and making it purely logical and rational. And so one of the best tools of resistance at our disposal is actually engaging with our emotional realities. 
So I want to extend an invitation to, uh, to you to participate in that with me this evening. The last, uh, the last PSA I want to deliver is that I'm going to be talking about colonialism, whiteness, patriarchy, capitalism, cis sexism, all these systems of oppression. And I'm kind of going to be talking about them interchangeably throughout the next hour. The, the, the topic I want to speak on, leveling the Quidditch playing field, um, is a very broad topic. And I wish I could go into each of the, those things in depth, but we only have so much time on our hands. And so um, I'm going to be talking about them as different sides of the same coin. That doesn't mean that these systems are not unique and that they don't have unique impacts and that we should always talk about them as though they're one and the same. But particularly what I wanna talk about is how those different systems of oppression enable and hold each other up. So that when the time comes, hopefully soon, we can work to bring it all down. Not just whiteness, not just colonialism, not just patriarchy, bring it all down and build something better. Okay, so that's with the PSAs. Uh, I wanna start by situating myself and situating my context. I'm going to begin with a land acknowledgement. For those of you that are unfamiliar, a land acknowledgement is a practice that draws attention to the history of the land that we reside on um, as a part of helping us understand our place within that history. Uh, I think many of you are from Canada, so those of you that are have likely heard land acknowledgements before. I don't know how frequently they're practiced in the United States. And for those of you that are calling in from outside of North America, this might be a new uh, concept for you. Uh, so I'll give you a bit of context. In Canada, um, land acknowledgements first of all, are a long-standing Indigenous practice. But in Canada, they became more commonplace after the Truth and Reconciliation Report was released. Um, so if you're interested, I really encourage you to go and learn more about the TRC as a, um, if you're unfamiliar. But uh, particularly the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Report called on us to engage on, with land acknowledgements as a way of engaging meaningfully with our legacy, with Canada's legacy of residential schools and the colonial history of Canada's erasure of Indigenous history. However, lately it's become very common to deliver land acknowledgements as a, as a way of effectively checking off a box. Like, yep, we've acknowledged Indigenous people. <laughs> and then we shake our hands of it and we move on. And that would be really contrary to my goals today to participate on that level. So I'm going to approach this land acknowledgement maybe a little bit differently than you're used to. Um, so I wanna start by naming that the continent of North America is known by many indigenous communities as Turtle Island. Many of us are spanning from across Turtle Island today. I'm based in the city of Toronto, which is a traditional territory of many indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee and many other diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Toronto is also the subject of the Toronto Purchase Treaty, Treaty 13, uh, which was signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. It's also covered by the Williams Treaty and that was signed with multiple Ch uh, Mississaugas and Chippewas bands. These treaties and many others signed by both American and Canadian governments reflect promises that were made to the people to whom this land actually belongs. Um, so if that sentence causes you discomfort, I wanna invite you to sit with that. This land actually does not belong to American and Canadian governments, right? The treaties that were signed by American and Canadian governments were treaties, uh, commitments, promises to peaceably share land. Last weekend, exactly a week ago, Julian Jones was killed by the RCMP. He was 28 years old. He was from the Tlao Kiat First Nation. RCMP in BC, in British Columbia, were responding to a distress call. They went to the Opitsat Reserve, which is where Julian resided. It was a place that was only accessible by boat. And Julian was shot upon answering the door. Julian is the second person from the Tlao Kiat First Nation to be killed by police in less than a year. Last year, Chantelle Moore, who is from the same First Nation, was also murdered by police when they were answering a mental health uh, distress call. In 2020, an analysis connect, uh, conducted by CTV News found that Indigenous people are 10 times more likely than a white person to be shot and killed by a police officer. And that's only based on data from 2017 onwards. 
So this is recent, this is recent data that informs that statistic. So why am I bringing up the murder of Julian Jones? A treaty agreement where land is transferred uh, peaceably from one nation to another is rendered meaningless when the state is actively participating in and enacting violence on Indigenous bodies. The relationship between both Canadian and American governments with the Indigenous peoples of this land reveals a very violent colonial history of genocide and subjugation. And it shows that in an, on an ongoing basis, the state is actively contradicting its own agreements. You might have heard the phrase um, in, your, in your time engaging in, in these sorts of concepts, uh, we are all treaty people. That's a phrase that's sometimes uh, talked about when we, when we talk about our own responsibilities towards Indigenous solidarity. What that phrase means for me is that regardless of how I came to be on this land, regardless of how my parents came to be on this land, I have a personal responsibility to upholding and honoring the agreements that were made with Indigenous people. And I'm accountable to how those agreements are presently being carried out. Even if I am not a member of the RCMP, even if I was not the person that signed Treaty 13 or the Williams Treaty, I have a personal responsibility to how that treaty is currently being practiced and committed to. And this is true. I, and so I want to pause here. And, and actually, for those of you that are living outside of Canada, you know, and you might be thinking, all right, well, this is very specific Canadian context. It doesn't apply to me. I think that's probably not true. I don't want to say for certain it's not true, but if you live anywhere in the Americas, North, South, or Central America, Indigenous people have been subjected to very similar comparable um, systems of oppression and discrimination. Um, and for folks in the United States, you we have a shared history. It's it's an identical history, actually. And so I'm going to just pause for a moment and ask you to reflect on some of the implications of this idea that we are all treaty people. Some questions to consider as you're reflecting. Uh, first, do you know whose land you're on? You know, we're guests here. So who's hosting you? And what are the rules? What are the treaties that govern the land that you're on? What is the history of those treaties? And, and knowing those things, I invite you to reflect on, on this question. What does being on this land compel you to do? What is your responsibility while you're on this land? How are you upholding treaty obligations? What I hope this land acknowledgement does is illustrate plainly what's at stake when it comes to equity and inclusion, why I'm here, why I think I was asked to be here. A very common misconception that I've heard recently is that recent events have prompted us to consider issues of inequity. And I wanna challenge that by naming the longstanding history of harm and state violence that predated the murder of George Floyd, that predated the murder of Regina Kurchinsky Paquette, that predated, you know, and I'm a participant in this, Quidditch Canada, USQ and MLQ's recent statements on anti-oppression, anti-racism. Oppressive institutions are very much relying on us to have a short-term memory, because if we treat this as a short-term problem, we're only going to generate short-term solutions. In fact, we need to really confront the reality that this is a conversation that started long before us. And in a lot of ways, as a sports and as, as a sport, as a, as a Quidditch community, we're just seeing a small tip of the iceberg. And so actually when we talk about measuring how far we've come when it comes to equity, it's more useful for us to consider not how far we've come in one year, but how far we've come in 16 years. Quidditch has been around for about 16 years. It's set out to create a foundation for a totally new kind of sport, one that circumvented gender norms and explicitly made space for difference. So in 16 years, um, how have we done? How do we think we're doing? What I want to propose to you today is that the framing of diversity and inclusion is probably not sufficient. It's not going to take us where we want to go. And let me explain what I mean by that. When we talk about diversity, we're talking very simply, very plainly about difference, right? A desire to diversify is a desire to see represented a multitude of different people in our sport. That's a very noble goal. That's a good thing to want. When we talk about inclusion, 
again, on a, on a very simple, straightforward level, we're talking about creating space, creating space for people to enter our community. And so diversity and inclusion in Quidditch, the combination of those two concepts is about bringing different people into our sport. And that doesn't sound like such a bad goal. It, it, it's, it's a good thing to work towards and we should continue to work towards it. But it's not gonna go far enough for us to create an equitable sport. The problem with diversity and inclusion is this. When we talk about different people participating in a system, that doesn't guarantee that anything changes with the system itself. Diversity does not guarantee change. When we talk about inclusion, we talk about creating space for people in a system that was designed for someone else. We're talking about bringing in marginalized people, black people, racialized people, indigenous people, gender non-conforming people into a system that was not built for them. And what we actually want for Quidditch is equity. But even equity is a term that has been a little bit sanitized by recent conversations. So let's talk a little bit more about what I mean by equity. Equity is uh, very commonly embodied by this graphic. Um, I, actually, wait, let's, let's engage with the chat here. By a quick show of hands in the chat, I don't know, who's seen some version of this, doc, of this graphic before? Awesome, yeah, perfect, that's great. All right, and now I'm gonna turn the chat away because it's very distracting. Um, right, so I, as I suspected, many of you are familiar with this graphic. Um, and, and basically what it comes down to is that uh, equity, sorry, equality is about giving everyone the same thing. Equity is about giving everyone what they need to participate fully in a system. What often goes unnamed about equity is this. Fundamentally, if you actually look at this picture and what it's trying to illustrate, equity is about a reallocation of resources, right? So we have three, three boxes total. You know, our tall friend over here doesn't need his, you know, his box, so we're gonna give it to somebody else. And, but through that resource allocation, people have received what they needed. But when society, the, when the society that we live in has disproportionately favored whiteness, patriarchy, capitalism, cisgendered folks, et cetera. The impact of equity is that people who have been favored by that system are going to have to lose a lot more than a box <laughs> in order for us to actually get to equity. And, and this is where diversity and inclusion kind of leads us astray. Diversity and inclusion gives us the impression that we can have it all, right? Everyone can participate, everyone can be included. But let's use this picture as an example. What if it's not just an issue of boxes? What if it's an issue of space? We actually only have one slot on the fence. So who are we gonna choose to have that slot, right? What about the issue of equity as it interacts before we even get to the game, right? What if it's about how many people are gonna be able to fit in the car on the way to the game or how many of them are gonna be able to drive? Um, if one person has to go and pick everyone else up and has to miss the game, is that a sacrifice that we're willing to make in the name of equity? Or let's even take it further and talk about the game itself. If the people who are participating in the game of baseball <laughs> I don't know, are them themselves racist, sexist? If an ownership uh, team, if an ownership team of a particular franchise participates in racist and sexist things, what does it say about equity if we're willing to give money to that institution and that we're even resourcing that franchise to begin with? What I wanna propose is that diversity and inclusion is a red herring. When we talk about creating spaces that everyone can participate in, we have to go beyond diversity and inclusion. We need to imagine a version of our sport that explicitly centers marginalized people and accounts for how historical and contemporary oppression manifests in our day-to-day -day lives. That's the project of equity. It's not about just including everyone. It's about explicitly accounting for the fact that over centuries, people have not been included. And so they need to be the focus of our conversation. So let's get the bad news out of the way. <laughs> We're not gonna get it right. 
We're never gonna get there in our lifetime. The nature of equity is not something you can get right. There's no way to guarantee that a person's experience of safety is uh, holistic when their experience of safety is also shaped by centuries of systemic oppression. Um, simply put, it's, it's not possible to account fully for the systemic issues that we ourselves are not outside of. Quidditch is, is immersed in this, in this reality. And to make plainly even further the bad news, if you're someone that's benefited from the system in your lifetime, true equity will require you to experience a deep loss of power. And the disappointing reality is that nobody is going to take that power away from you. You actually have to be willing to give it up. And the truth of, of the matter is that those of us who have power have not been prepared to live in a world without it. That takes years and years of work. So that's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that it's possible to be better and not just a little better. It's possible to be a lot better, whole orders of magnitude better. The fact that you're here is proof of that conversation, right? The fact that we're even engaging in this is proof of that reality. And yes, you will lose something in participating in this, but more good news is that there are absolutely personal benefits to you for engaging in equity. And what I mean by that is not sort of like, the corporate equity benefits everyone discourse, you know, like, ah, yeah, diversity helps us innovate and we're exposed to new ideas and those new ideas make us stronger. All of that is true, but that's not what I'm referring to. Um, what I mean is that a system of oppression, regardless of if it's whiteness, if we're talking about patriarchy, if we're talking about colonialism, that system harms everyone. Even the people that benefit from oppression are harmed by oppression. Let me elaborate on that. White supremacy and racism is harmful to racialized people, but it's also a form of self-harm for white people. Patriarchy, yes, causes harm to women, trans, gender non-conforming people, but it deeply, deeply, deeply harms men. Some of, this might not be new to you, um, but if it is, I, I wanna spell it out even further. What are some of the ways that oppression hurts us? We're taught from an early age that we should be disconnected from, from people who are different than us and understand ourselves as being better than. And when we do that, we actually distort and put out of reach real human connection with most of humanity. We, we isolate ourselves in doing that. When we engage solely with white colonial patriarchal versions of history, we're actually being asked to admire and role model ourselves after colonizers and slave owners and rapists and misogynists and thieves and people who have committed harmful, violent acts of genocide and called them necessary evils. That doesn't seem like a, a, a healing way to engage with history. When we prescribe the ideas of whiteness and maleness to white men, we force people of European descent to erase their own culture in order to conform to whiteness and this weird white dominant culture. White, whiteness was not a culture, you know, some 500 years ago, right? That is a very new and recent phenomena. When we instruct white people and cis men to dissociate from their bodies and revere thinking over feeling, we're teaching people to actively ignore the information or wisdom that we get from our own bodies and our own emotion. Our bodies and our emotions are a deep source of wisdom and intuition that we should be allowed to be relying on on a day-to-day -day basis. And whiteness and patriarchy um, remove that possibility from us. Um, systems of oppression ingrain in us values of dominance and greed and very simplistic ideas of winners and losers. Um, fostering a false and unachievable ideal of wealth that puts us in competition with each other. And finally, not finally, but finally on my list, patriarchy, white supremacy, colonialism, they foster a sense that marginalized people are always interested in vengeance for harm. And that creates a constant state of anxiety about one's status in the world. And it creates an inability to envision a world that's actually based on equity and on human connection. These ways of being, these deeply harmful ways of being are white ways of being. That's what is meant when we invoke whiteness. Not that all white people are, are evil or that all men are evil, but that we have produced a way of being in the world that is unnatural and that causes real harm to all of us.
So when I say that there's good news, what I mean is this, the more we work to consider and to honor the humanity of the people who are different from us, the closer we get to our own humanity. And there's something healing about that. We can, we can heal ourselves through this process. So you might be wondering, uh, what does all of that have to do with Quidditch, <laughs> right? That's what, that's what we're here to talk about. What does all of this have to do with Quidditch? Um, I don't think it's probably news to anyone that sports have a super long established history of being an agent for change. Sports are in many ways a microcosm of the larger society. We can draw tons of parallels between society and sports in terms of race and labor and gender and politics and land justice and the list goes on. I don't think Quidditch alone can solve our problems, but I think Quidditch is a highly effective tool at our disposal for connection and for empowerment and to get us to where we want to go, which is equity. Uh, but if we want Quidditch to be a part of the solution, we have to better understand the problem. So let's actually try and unravel it. Um, unravel the problem, I mean. Why does oppression exist? <laughs> I'm laughing because it's obviously an impossible question to answer, not one that I'm going to be able to answer fully in the next 30 minutes. Um, super fun aside, but the history of oppression in North America actually like predates colonization. You can go all the way back to European colonizers and how they enacted harm on their own populations through things like serfdom and other early forms of capitalism. And then colonizers arrived here and they replicated those acts of violence against indigenous peoples here. And, and it's a very fascinating history, but we can't get too far into it. And so instead, what I want to briefly touch on is a framework that was created by Andrea Smith, who's a Cherokee scholar based in the United States. And she created this framework called Heteropatriarchy and the Three Pillars of White Supremacy. And it, uh, it clearly articulates uh, three separate logics that uphold and enact systems of oppression in North America. So I'm gonna talk about each of these logics briefly, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna share how this is related to, our, to where we're going. So the first pillar is the logic of slavery. Um, and this refers to state enforced definitions of black people as property. Through history, slavery has taken many different forms and we may not necessarily be engaged in formal systems of slavery today, but we do see the ongoing commoditization of racialized bodies in other ways. A common example you might be familiar with is the high rates of incarceration with black and indigenous people. The second pillar is the logic of genocide. This logic holds that indigenous people must disappear. Actually, Andrea Smith writes, they must always be disappearing. And this is what allows non-indigenous people to claim rightful ownership over land and resources. And the third pillar is the logic of Orientalism. This logic refers to the so-called idea that Western countries are superior than non-Western countries and mark certain nations as inferior or as posing a constant threat to the state. Um, we see a lot of this both in the United States and in Canada. In the United States, I'd say it's, it's very heightened uh, in terms of like the racial profiling of Arab Americans, um, the war on terror, build the wall rhetoric. All of this is informed by the logic of Orientalism. These three pillars illustrate that the contemporary harms that are currently being done against marginalized people have massive, long-standing, ongoing logics that inform them, in, in starting with the genocide of Indigenous people, the kidnapping and enslavement of Black people, torture, brutality against Black and Indigenous people persisting today with unemployment dis discrimination, school to prison pipelines, ongoing treaty violations, environmental injustices that disproportionately impact racialized communities, biased media and storytelling. We have to confront this history. If we want to imagine a version of Quidditch that, that combats oppression, anti-oppression, right? That's what we want. We have to contend with this history. We have to name it. We have to center it because we're fully steeped in it. We are, Quidditch is, <laughs> Quidditch is right here. 
is the next dot, right? And so how do we want to respond to three, 400 years of history? The more we steep in it, the more we internalize it and the more we replicate it. So we have to name it. I wanna go back to something that I named at the beginning of the conversation and a little earlier, which is the role that emotion and feeling play in oppression. One of the ways that we've internalized the three pillars of white supremacy is by separating emotion from logic. Um, where this binary comes from is uh, the subject of lots of study and discourse, um, but in part, it's used to disregard collective and emotionally expressive cultures, usually Afrocentric cultures, as being primitive, as being less than, and then raising up individualist societies and less emotionally expressive societies, particularly Eurocentric ones, as though they are superior. So that's part of where this like emotion versus logic dichotomy comes from. And I think in order to confront this history, in order to combat it, we have to recenter emotion and uh, feeling in conversations about oppression. Because experiences of oppression are deeply subjective and because emotions need to be respected as sources of intuition and knowledge. We're human, so we think and we feel. Very rarely are we engaged in a logical process that is completely devoid of emotion. And that's what brings me back to sports. The powerful role that sports have played in helping us navigate systems of oppression, we have lots of recent examples, right? We have all of the amazing work that the WNBA does. The WNBA just exists and that's, <laughs> that's enough, right? Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the national anthem, the ongoing indigenous reclamation of lacrosse and their participation in lacrosse as a way of reaffirming indigenous nationhood. Those are just a few examples of how sports can emulate and uphold principles of justice. But going a step further, using sports as a tool for justice is actually a way that we can circumvent this false emotion logic dichotomy. Yes, emotional expression is extremely regulated in a sports environment. The way certain bodies express emotion is subject to very real consequences. Um, a, an example, you know, the way a black woman expresses emotion on the field is subject to far more scrutiny than the way a white man might express that emotion. And we need to name that as a reality. But if we boil team sports in particular, because now I want to bring it back to Quidditch, if we boil team sports down to their fundamental roots, I would argue that it's at its very basic bare bones, a collective embodied experience of feeling. I want you to think about, you know, why you love Quidditch. What was the moment that was like, dang, I just, I love the sport, right? Think about the full range of emotion and feeling that you personally experienced in playing this game and how that emotion was expressed between yourself and your teammates and fans and opponents. And I would probably venture to guess that there are very few, if any other settings where that kind of emotion could be expressed in that particular way. And so if we can start the conversation about social justice and about anti-oppression by making room for both logic and emotion and by naming sports as a place where those two things come together, then we're already a step further than we were when we started. We're already doing better. So I'm gonna pause and drink some tea. If Quidditch is going to be a tool of justice for us, we need to come to some collective decisions about what the guiding principles are gonna be that inform how we move ahead. In other words, what are uh, the logics of equity in Quidditch? So I, I wanna propose three, three pillars, the three pillars of equity in Quidditch. And I'll go over them in, in more detail. And this is just my perspective. This is my proposal. So something I'd be interested in hearing about both here on the chat or later in Slack is how these resonate with you. Um, and, and whether or not you see this as a possibility for moving forward. So I'll start with the first one, which is that Quidditch is not an exception to the rule. What I mean by this is that 
particularly in early conversations about equity and in early conversations about Quidditch, at least in as far as I've participated in those conversations, it's, it's very much been about how Quidditch is different, you know, how we're a different kind of sport, how the people that participate in Quidditch are different. And that's true in that we all ride with a broom between our legs. But when we talk about systemic oppression and discrimination, we are participants in the same system. There is um, an ongoing debate about whether sports are a tool for escapism or a tool for engagement. Do we go to sports because we want to escape the real world or do we want to go to sports because it allows us to engage deeper in the world that is already ongoing around us? Um, I don't know where, where many of you fall in that debate, but I think one thing that we can agree on is that at the end of the day, you are not a different person when you play Quidditch than you are when you're off pitch. So what that means is when you, when you think back to you know, a few slides ago, all of the history that's out there, all of the, the sort of socially toxic systems of oppression that we have immersed ourselves in and have internalized, that's gonna come out when we play Quidditch. That's gonna come out when we participate in the organizing of Quidditch and the organizing of our events and the engagement that we have with each other. We carry that weight with us on pitch. In life, this is, and I'm just speaking to my own experience, but in life, when you, when you experience more pressure in a particular situation, how you behave shows you more of who you are. And sports constantly puts you in a position to experience pressure. And so who you, how you show up in that moment really is defining of who you are and how you wanna be. The idea of individual exceptionalism is one that I've participated in myself. And so I'm going to share an experience and I'd be interested in hearing if this resonates with anybody else in the room. When I was first starting in Quidditch, um, I was, this was the first full contact sport that I'd ever played. Uh, I used to play other sports, but I'd taken a long pause and then came back and entered Quidditch um, much in my mid twenties. And I was very much tied to this idea of being the best woman on the team. It was not something that I expressed, but it was something that I really needed for myself and I really had to, had to internalize because that's who I was being put in competition with and that's who I was being compared to. And so I, I really bought into the idea of I'm better than the other woman on my team. I really bought into that. And that caused a lot of harm. It, you know, when we talk about how oppression harms us, I was creating a competition with people who I was trying to play with on, on a basic sports level that goes very much contrary to the goals of Quidditch and the goals of teamwork. Um, and the resentment that I felt when I wasn't put on pitch was towards other women, not towards my coach, not towards the gender rule that has been interpreted as um, you know, as a bit of a, a, a minimum quotia or ratio, um, not towards the broader issue of uh, sexism in sports and how sexism in sports has created an environment in which the expectations of women and gender nonconforming people are limited. That's not where my anger was. My anger was towards my peers. Um, and, and so I replicated a system of harm in participating in that. On the flip side, as uh, as a woman participating in Quidditch, as a racialized woman participating in Quidditch, I've, I've experienced instances of racism in Quidditch, particularly when I uh, first started as, as a coach. I would uh, take to uh, the, you know, the, the experience of being a speaking captain is a deeply disconcerting one. Uh, the, those of you that um, do it regularly and with grace, I envy you. Um, it's certainly not my strong suit, but I paid very much close attention to the ways that referees were interacting with me um, in my first year as a coach. And I, I was so sure that I was getting it wrong. Referees never change calls. I feel like I'm not saying my point clearly. I feel like I'm constantly being told to go back to my bench. I wonder what it is that I'm doing in this interaction that's creating this particular issue. Um, I've been called angry. I've been scoffed at in doing my role as, as a speaking captain. Um, and it wasn't until I was able to speak to some of my peers and actually name that frustration that I realized that my experience was unique to other male coaches. 
And it wasn't actually until talking to other female coaches that I realized that we had a shared experience of being dismissed. We need to be willing to name harm when it happens. I think there's a fear when we, when we talk about Quidditch that if we say that Quidditch is not the perfect you know, system, not the perfect sport that we want it to be, that we're gonna turn people away. Um, actually racialized people are expecting racism everywhere. You know, gender non-conforming people are expecting transphobia. Women are expecting sexism. And I'll speak personally from experience. I'm more suspicious of a place that claims to be free of those things than a space that claims to be actively working to contend with those realities. So Quidditch is not an exception to the rule. Inclusion for some is inclusion for none. This is a principle that I uh, am borrowing from Rene Edo Lodge, who's an author. Um, he writes, liberation for some is liberation for none. Uh, so this is a play on that. We need to stop centering whiteness in conversations about equity. What I mean for that is when we talk about how we're going to include people, we start with how we're already including people. Well, this is how cisgendered people participate in our sport. So how can we modify that for trans people? This is how white people participate in our sport. So how are we gonna modify that for racialized people? This is how men participate. So how are we gonna modify that for women and, and gender non-conforming people? Intersectionality, the, the principle of intersectionality calls on us to understand how different systems of oppression are interacting to create unique experiences of power and harm. If we can actually account for a common denominator, if we can build a sport for someone that experiences unique systems of oppression, people who don't experience that oppression are going to fit in just fine. <laughs> But if we build the sport for people that don't experience those systems of oppression, so many people are going to be left behind. So we need to think about how we're explicitly centering marginalized people, not dominant identities in conversations about equity. The last principle, I didn't have a lot of text here. There are no best practices, only leading practices. What do I mean by that? Best practices imply that there's a right way to do this. That might be language that you've, if you, again, if you've participated in conversations about equity and inclusion, that might be something that you'd heard before that there are best practices when it comes to diversity and inclusion. There are best practices when it comes to equity. Um, I think that we need, to, we need to contend with the possibility that nobody else is doing it the way we need to do it. Um, I think best practices can be a source of comfort. It means that there's somewhere that we can look to for a solution. It means that there's a right way to, to do this. Um, and, and there isn't. There are many wrong ways <laughs> to, to engage in this work, but there is no one right way. It's unique to our context. So when, when we talk about leading practices, we're talking about imagining something totally different for Quidditch. What does Quidditch uniquely create for us? Well, for me, when I think about why I came to Quidditch, when I think about what Quidditch has offered me, Quidditch comes from a story. It's a story that is problematic in its own way, but, but it's a story that we can tell ourselves. There's, there's a narrative potential with Quidditch that I think we need to explore. What story do we want to tell about what kind of sport we are? What story do we want to tell about the kind of people we are when we play the sport? How can we lead on creating something different and new and incredible? How can we have a community focused approach to Quidditch? I don't know that I know what that looks like yet, but I'm excited by that possibility. I think that would be the absolute coolest thing in the world if we could explore not what you know the WNBA does great, not what the NFL ugh, does great, not what the amazing black, brown, racialized athletes around the world, the amazing gender non-conforming leaders that we have to look to, not what they do great. What they do great is awesome. That should be something that we honor and celebrate. What does Quidditch do great? What are we great at? I think it's time to think about doing things in a new way, to work outside of a system instead of a participant of a system. It's a lot that I've put on the table. Um, 
I don't know that uh, my intention here was to, to tell us how we're going to get there, but really about naming where we're going to get shared understanding of where we're going. And so what I wanna leave you with are three questions. To the folks who have primarily benefited from systems of oppression in sport, in Quidditch, I want you to reflect on what you're willing to give up and how you're willing to, how you're going to let go of it. Um, if you're a writer, write it down. If you like to think verbally, talk about this with, with uh, another, another attendee here at QuidCon. What are you willing to give up and how are you going to let it go? To the black, brown, indigenous, women, gender non-conforming people who participate in this sport and who um, I'm very privileged to have here in this space with me today, you're deeply worthy of a sport and of a community that welcomes you as you are. And so to you, I wanna ask specifically, what are you willing to ask for? How can we build a sport in collaboration with you and with you in mind? And for us collectively, the question I wanna ask is how far are we willing to go to create an equitable sport? How much do we wanna shake things up? I think that the, the road to equity is a long one. So let's get to work. Uh, I, I wanna thank you all again so much for uh, listening to me today. I know that I've probably put out more questions than answers. Um, and so to that, I, I wanted to leave some time at the end for any questions that people might have. I want to make myself available in the Slack channel as well. So if you have any questions there, that's definitely a place that um, I'm very happy to engage with. I strongly encourage you to, to talk with each other about some of the things that I've mentioned and named here today. Our community has so much richness and knowledge. A lot of what I've named here, I've learned from other people. So I, I, again, I want to just center and name that. Um, and so with the time that I have remaining, I wanna invite questions about um, any of the things that I've talked about, or if you have particular ideas that you wanna explore and talk through, this is a space for that as well. So if you're you know, thinking about what a potential solution looks like to a problem that you're facing, if we wanna do some collective group thinking on what the next steps are, um, that's definitely something that we have uh, space and time for here. So um, thank you again so much. Uh, and I can be contacted at the, at the email on the screen if you ever just want to chat. And so with that, I'm going to uh, head towards uh, some questions. Oh my goodness, there are so many comments and so many questions. This is great. Um, all right, question. Is it best for a ref to acknowledge their bias mid-game or post-game? As soon as possible would be my answer to that question. Um, yeah. I think that any person that has the self-awareness to recognize their own bias in the moment is someone that has been deeply engaging with this work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I know for me as a speaking captain, if a ref came to me and said, I just wanna acknowledge that I don't think I've been treating you very fairly in this game, that would do huge wonders for me because you know something that I walk away from in those moments is, uh, is a feeling of being gaslighted, is a feeling of not knowing whether I imagined that oppression um, or if I if that was actually a real interaction. So I would say as soon as possible, if, if you have the comfort and the skill to, um, to engage with that, that's definitely what I would recommend. Another question. In the US, we are just starting to practice land acknowledgements. Do you have resources and best practices on how we could expand the practice in the United States? Oh my goodness, yes, I have so many resources. So um, maybe in the Slack channel, oh, I don't know for sure. I'm way too technologically illiterate for my age. Um, in the Slack channel, I'll share all, all the resources that I have on land acknowledgements, but um, I'm not sure what this looks like in the US, but in, the, in Canada, across Canada, we have um, something called friendship centers. Um, which are centers that are um, run and, and um, organized by Indigenous people and they're located across uh, Canada. And so I would say in Quidditch, it would be really cool to start looking at what some Indigenous partnerships would, would look like in the United States. Um, 
Something that we're just starting to explore at Quidditch Canada is how we invite elders to major events. That's something that we're just in the beginning stages of. So I would say thinking about partnership and doing things uh, alongside people. Uh, you know, if somebody's going to be impacted by a decision, how do you include them in that decision? Um, I think that would be a really amazing, a really amazing thing to engage with. Do you have any words for marginalized gender tournaments like femme fatale fantasies? Yes, oh my goodness. I love those, uh, those kinds of gender tournaments. I think that, um, you know, uh, another question that was asked was what does it mean to give up power in the Quidditch context? Those kinds of, um, those kinds of, you know, uh, identity exclusive spaces are exactly an example of giving up power in Quidditch, um, you know, so I think that they're really incredible resources. I think that they're very powerful tools for recruitment and collaboration. I think they're great for promoting leadership. Um, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I love them. Uh, that's, that's all I have to say. I don't know if there was anything specific that you were looking for with that, but yeah, those kinds of women and gender non-conforming exclusive spaces are, are really great. And I think a way that we can lead in Quidditch um, is by thinking about how female centered spaces and gender non-conforming spaces can be trans inclusive because that's something that in North America, actually globally, um, the idea of women centered spaces that are trans inclusive is something that globally, you know, we really struggle with. So that could be, that's an avenue of possibility for Quidditch in terms of, of leading on that front. What does it mean to give up power in the Quidditch context? This is a big question. Um, it can look very obvious, you know, how do coaches pass the reins on to a player that maybe doesn't have the opportunity to make decisions and to impact playing Quidditch? If you're a primary ball handler, how are you telling the person that doesn't have the ball to bring up the, bring up the quaffle? What's more important to you in the moment is that you look like the star and that you score the goal right away or that you are empowering somebody else to participate in the game fully. Um, as organizers and administrators, um, I think a lot of giving up power means admitting when we've made mistakes. That's something that I think as a Quidditch community we really struggle with is, um, is being grace gracious in acknowledging when we've done harm. Um, a great resource that I'll name is something called the anatomy of an apology. It was developed by a Toronto based anti oppressive activist. Um, I will, uh, I will drop the resource in the in the slack but um, yeah, so how do we apologize and through apologies give up power that's a really important um, space for that as well. I think that um, when we talk about you know, wanting to reaffirm our commitment to equity. Uh, sometimes we take up more space than we should. Sometimes that's digitally. <laughs> um, those of you who love Facebook, I'm talking to you. Uh, sometimes that means, you know, in decision-making spaces. Um, so it can look like a lot of different things, but ultimately giving up power is gonna be something that's very unique to you. So it, it really starts with reflecting on what power you have access to and, and going from there. How do we include people with disabilities in the sport? Oh, another great question. I definitely, and thank you, the person who's asked for identifying that I don't have the solution. Um, and thank you for not expecting me to have the solution. I think that um, disability and sport is, uh, you know, there's lots of um, models to explore there. In Canada, we've, uh, through a lot of the hard work of Jill Stanick and Brian Galloway, we've been able to model some versions of wheelchair Quidditch, which have been really promising. And in the versions of wheelchair Quidditch that we've piloted in Canada, able-bodied and disabled people participate in that version of the sport. So, you know, that's another version of, of equitable participation and, and what that looks like. Um, I think, you know, disability and disability justice is a very broad topic, right? So when we talk about disabilities, we could be referring to mental, um, mental health and mental disabilities, we could be talking about physical disabilities, we could be talking about learning disabilities. Um, and so the response to that is going to be uh, very unique. Um, but uh, I think, you know, those are just some of the examples that I can think of. Sorry, I really want to try and answer all these questions because they're so good. Um, all right. Ha any advice on how to ensure that you are creating a safe and welcoming space when it comes to recruitment? 
how to make it clear that this is something we are aware of and trying to work on on a team level as well. I wanna give a very particular shout out to the Athlete Ally course that I took when I was an MLQ head coach for the first time. And the Athlete Ally course um, talked, so I encourage you all to take it. It's free to take, I think. So if you, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm gonna have to write down all of the resources that I plan on dropping in the Slack. But um, it's, a, it's a great course. And in that course, they talk about how important it is for a team to create values and how they're going to tie those values to their sport and to how they practice on a team basis. Um, so one thing that I would do if I were a team, one thing that I've done as a team leader is uh, created values collaboratively with my leadership team and with the players on my team. And at every practice, at every tryout, at every recruitment event, those values are prominently displayed and talked about in a very specific contextual context. Um, and uh, what that does is it creates space for the conversation. So it allows us to name, you know, we value anti-racism, for example. It allows us to name that as a value and it allows us to speak to where we're at on that journey without necessarily having to wait for a black or brown or indigenous person to ask about, you know, how we're doing in racism. It actively signals that it's something that we're thinking about. How do you suggest uh, for us to call out bias that we witness or bias that is targeted towards us? Uh, this is an art form. <laughs> this is an art form that takes years of practice. Um, and it's going to heavily depend on the context. There are lots of um, strategies for interruption. Uh, that's a, another resource that I will be sure to name in the chat. Um, strategies for disrupting bias and strategies for disrupting oppression when it occurs. Um, one thing that I think I, I just want to name is that sometimes it's not uh, safe for us to call out bias and sometimes it's not comfortable for us to call out bias. Um, and so actually very similar to, to what I was saying at the beginning of the conversation, it can be challenging in the moment to distinguish between whether your hesitancy of approaching something is because of a lack of safety or because of a lack of comfort. Um, so I'll put some, some specific strategies. There are actually some really great scripts that um, are very useful for, for that sort of thing. A another practice that I, that I like to employ when I'm a, a team leader anyway is, um, I actually practice and role model this with um, other members of my team. So um, when I, I say, here's my expectation for inevitably when bias shows up, here's my expectation about how we're gonna navigate it. And then it, it creates a sense of collective responsibility. I know that's not always something that we can do in the moment, but um, that's, a, that's a strategy that, that I like to employ where possible. Um, land acknowledgements are something that I've never heard of. Do you believe it would be possible to try and set it up in a country like France? Obviously not the same history, but still. That's a great question. I think that um, I would start if I were in a different country by exploring the colonial role that the state of France has played in its interaction with indigenous people. With countries like France and other European countries that have not only been colonized, but were colonizers, I think that's going to be a very unique approach and context. So I think that starts with research um, and figuring out, you know, a land acknowledgement in Canada and in North America is about situating ourselves in the history of the land. So, you know, elsewhere, I think it would be about understanding what it is that you're acknowledging. Uh, but that's a great question. Um, all right, I think I have room for one more question. Okay, uh, do you know of any existing bias check or similar self-checking resources for us to analyze our own pre-existing policies for bias that we might not have noticed before? Yeah, I actually do have some. So uh, I'm very happy to share those in the Slack. Um, a lot of it is about uh, inviting other people to join you in that. So there's a saying, we don't know what we don't know. That, uh, that's a very common saying. Um, and so the only way to know is by inviting other people to participate in that process with us. I'm so sorry I couldn't get to all of the questions. You folks have been an incredible group um, and I, I'll be available in the Slack for other questions and other comments.
thank you again so much and I'll pass it on to the next people.